my job is to listen. I listen to governments, to countries, to investors, to the poor, to the rich, to NGOs, to donors, to economists, educators, sociologists. I listen to problems, to policies, to projects. The bank pays me to listen. And once in a while, I get to sit back and ask myself, what am I hearing? What is the one common message going across all these people and ideas? Today, that message is very loud and very clear. And it's this. We are on our way to knowing the poor by name, individually, one by one. You see, the poor were always thought of as groups. Those that live in a certain part of town, those that look in a certain way, a certain skin color, those that do certain jobs, like repairing shoes in West Africa. So development was about doing things for the group. Build them a school, a road, a clinic. That is changing. Today we are on our way to knowing the poor as people, individually. She has six kids. She lives in a house with dirt floor, no electricity or water connection. Her family eats once a day. She's sick. Her name is Amal. We know that poor person individually. This started 20 years ago in my beloved Mexico of all places. And when the then president and his director of the budget decided that they were going to start transferring money directly to the poor, everyone thought it was a very bad idea. Bureaucrats, technocrats, the politicians, the World Bank, the Catholic Church, the media, we all thought, bad idea. Um, we had this deep fear that once the poor received the money, they would stop working, and they would end up worse off. In fact, the program was called Progresa, which in Spanish means go forward. Journalists would mock it and call it Cerveza, which means beer. <laughs> And the idea, the idea itself didn't make any political sense. It was going to bring poverty to the forefront, to the center stage of the social debate in Mexico, for a party that had been in office for 70 years. So it was going to beg the question, what have you been doing all these years that we now found out that there are so many poor people among us? Well, the president and his director of the budget did it anyway. So the debate quickly turned towards conditions. Put conditions to the transfer. Give the money to the poor only if they keep their kids in school. Give the money to the pregnant mother only if she, check, she checks herself in a clinic regularly. The debate was all about conditionality. And when you look back all these years, we realize now that we were all wrong, completely wrong. By and large, the poor were going to keep their kids in a school if there was a a school the kids could attend. The pregnant mother was going to check herself in a clinic if there was a doctor ready to listen to her. The conditions didn't matter. What really mattered is that the transfer itself forced the Mexican government to reach out and meet the poor person individually, to literally drive and meet that person and say, here is money for you. To their surprise, the first thing they found out, we all found out, is that many of these poor people didn't exist. They were standing there, but they didn't have birth certificate, ID, property titles, contracts. They didn't actually vote, speaking of politics. These people were not just poor, they were excluded. They were not part of the system as we know it. And also the transfer forced the Mexican government to establish a logistical mechanism to deliver the cash. At that time, it was literally a pickup truck driving into a community, setting up a table, giving money out on the right, and taking signatures on the left. Most signatures were an X, which must have given heartburn to the Auditor General of Mexico, because it was public money going to private people. Fast forward to today. 70 developing countries, 35 of which in Africa, are transferring money directly to their poor. Some conditionally, some unconditionally. And the technology to identify people and to transfer money to them 
is getting cheaper, faster, and better by the hour. India has shown us that you can identify 500 million people in about five years. It costs about $4 per person, and it takes 30 seconds. Somebody looks into your eyes. They shine a light into your eyes. The light comes back with the biometric information from your retina, goes up to a handheld device, up to a satellite, down to a mainframe, and now you exist. And let me tell you, if you didn't exist before, existing must be a great feeling. No wonder thousands of Indians are queuing to be identified. This is inclusion by technology. And of course, the logistics of transferring the money is also cheaper and faster and better. You don't have to drive a pickup truck anywhere anymore. You can just do it with a cell phone transfer, a debit card, or a point of sale. All this is fundamentally changing the way we think about economic development, but more importantly, the way we fight poverty in the trenches. First, every time the poor exercise the transfer, meaning they spend the money, they give you information back on their location, preferences, costs, needs. And you can use that information to improve the next intervention. This is becoming to social policy what Google is to the internet. Every search improves the chances of success of the next search. So you can stop doing stupid things, like subsidizing the rich. We have countries in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere that spend more money paying for the gasoline consumed by the rich than paying for the primary schooling consumed by the poor. That's a fact. Second, you can begin to listen to the poor. You can do something that is called real-time continuous household panel surveys. The stati statisticians among you are probably salivating now. This is their dream. <laughs> what it really means is that you follow the same household over time. That's the concept of panel. So you can ask questions. You told us you had a young daughter a few years ago. Is somebody talking to her about reproductive health today? You told us that your family's main staple food is rice, rice. We notice that the price of rice in your country has doubled. Are you eating less rice? Is your family eating less? Are you eating less? So you can react much faster and better when there is a crisis. Ask yourselves why, when the American economy collapsed in 2008, 2009, there was no social explosion in Mexico. Not one single street demonstration in Mexico City. The reason is that with a simple computer program, the government could transfer more cash to the five million families that were identified to be the ones that were going to suffer the most. And finally, you can turn citizens, poor and rich, into actual shareholders of their country's natural wealth, a wealth that anyway belongs to them. You can start distributing to citizens universally and uniformly a part of the rents from oil, gas, or minerals that today go from the big extractive industry directly into the government's coffers. Sure, the money will not mean much for the rich. They may not even bother picking it up. But for the poor, it may make the difference between hunger and no hunger. Now, I'm sure you are thinking governments will oppose this. In incumbent governments will never go for it because they will never give up the power of deciding who gets the rent and who doesn't. It makes no political sense. Well, it didn't make political sense for the Mexican government to transfer money to their poor 20 years ago. And they did it anyway. All it really takes is one enlightened, stubborn leader to do it, and others will follow. Of course, all these are just examples of how technology is changing the balance in the war on poverty. There are many other examples. But when you listen to them, what do you hear? What do you really hear? It is pretty loud and clear. We are not just on our way to knowing the poor by name. We are on our way to ending poverty as we know it. Soon there will be no reason for anyone to live under the poverty line. No reason for people to live with $2 a day or less. There will be no reason at all. That, to me, is a real message. Thank you very much.